Hello, and welcome to the National Press Foundation. We're coming to you from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios in Washington, DC. I'm Sunny Efron, NPF's president. And today we're talking about a digital dollar. This program is part of the National Press Foundation's ongoing series on international trade for journalists. We would like to thank our sponsor, the Heinrich Foundation. For those of you covering the US-China relationship, our next program will be on economic espionage. The director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, testified to Congress last month that the FBI has 2,000 investigations linked to the Chinese government and is opening one every 10 hours. Just like the Trump administration, the Biden administration is promising to crack down on IP theft. We'll be announcing the details shortly. To keep up with NPF with our programming and our award deadlines, you can sign up for our newsletter. The link is in the chat. So I'm delighted today to have a guest moderator to guide you through this complex topic. Heather Dahl is a former journalist, a former chairman of the board of NPF and a current board member. And more importantly, Heather is CEO of Indicio.tech and an expert in digital identity. Our guests are Daniel Gorfine, founder and CEO of Gattaca Horizons LLC. He's also a co-founder of the Digital Dollar Project and he also teaches FinTech law and policy at the Georgetown University Law Center. Adrian Harris is a professor of practice at the Ford School at the University of Michigan. Previously, she served as a special assistant for economic policy to President Obama at the White House National Economic Council. She's gonna talk about what's at stake for US policymakers. And finally, welcome to Josh Lipsky, who heads the Geoeconomic Center at the, at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Josh previously served as a senior advisor at the IMF and also worked at the State Department. And he's the brains behind the uh, Central Bank Digital Currency Tracker, which is on the Atlantic Council website. It's a great re uh, resource for journalists, um, as you will learn. So thanks again to all of you for being here. And uh, Heather, let me turn this over to you. Thank you, Sunny. I'm going to uh, share a deck that we'll use. So thank you to everyone who joined us. I know um, today we're going to walk through a number of topics in our agenda. The great thing about our panelists is they're ready to talk and take all of your questions, no matter how simple you think the question is or complex. And so because today's topic is quite expansive with the digital dollar, and we know that those who are joining us today have various backgrounds in understanding this. We have uh, journalists who may have never heard of this before, caught the um, title of this webinar and said, I need to learn more. To those of you who probably have been covering this for a while, whether it is following currencies, uh, economic policy, or crypto, and so you have more familiarity with this. So what we wanna do is tackle a number of topics We'll discuss each one of them. And we're also gonna take your questions in real time as we move through here. You can ask questions um, either by raising your hand in the chat or you can type your question as well in the chat and we will bring those into our conversation. So in, the, in our session today, we're gonna cover the basic. What is a digital dollar? Then we're gonna move into where are these digital currencies gaining traction? We'll have a conversation around why do we need a digital dollar? Then some of you may be asking, well, how will a digital dollar work? We'll go into some details, talk more about who would use the digital dollar, and then we'll close it up where we're gonna talk about the economic and policy implications of a digital dollar. To kick things off, we're gonna go to Josh. And Josh is going to break down the evolution of money. How is a digital dollar different from the cash you hold, the electronic transfer um, funds that you transfer in your day-to-day -day life, or even cryptocurrency? So Josh, I'm gonna turn it over to you to break down these particular categories. Sure, well, thanks Heather and thanks Sunny. Thanks everyone in the National Press Foundation for having us and an honor to be with my fellow panelists talking about such an interesting, important and I think often misunderstood topic. And uh, we, again, want to take your questions and just have as interactive as possible a conversation. Usually when we have this conversation, I think it's important to start out with definitions and people have different definitions in these topics. So if you just take a step back and think about money, and we're not going to go through the whole history of money, that would be a whole separate story. But you know, for almost a thousand years since China created it, there's been paper money. And that's nothing new to anyone. 
Uh, and then for basically several decades, we've had electronic money. Think of debit cards, credit cards, later online banking and Venmo. And again, people use a lot of technical terms when we talk about money, but I think a lot of this is actually intuitive to people for anyone who uses money, which is actually everyone. So it doesn't need to be as complicated as people make it out to be. But what we're talking about here is something newer. It's really about five, six years old, if you wanna talk about usage, and that's digital currencies. And we'll talk about why it's a little different than electronic money. And so if you go to the next slide, I think what's helpful to do is think about what are the different categories of digital currencies? Because when people say digital currencies, they almost always mean one of three things. And so I find it helpful to break it into basically three categories. The first is unregulated decentralized cryptocurrencies. And this is what everyone's probably most familiar with. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, the now famous Dogecoin that Elon Musk talked about on Saturday Night Live. What are these? Well, they're not issued by a government. They're not issued by any central authority. They're not attached, or as we say, pegged to the dollar or to the euro or to the yen. So they're created by a network. They very often use distributed ledger technology to secure and verify. And we'll talk about what that means, but it's a new technology that helps basically create a network effect that a group is instantaneously telling you that this is a valid token or asset. And basically they have value because people want them because most of them have scarcity. There's a limited amount of them in circulation and you can exchange most of them for goods. So they serve the basic purposes of a currency. And this is usually what people mean when they talk about digital currencies, unregulated decentralized cryptocurrencies. But there's a second category that's equally important and these are stable coins. And the most famous example of this is probably Facebook's Libra project, which is now called the DM project. And what that means is that you use the technology of a cryptocurrency distributed ledger, but you're attaching the value to something that already exists. Could be the dollar, could be gold, could be what Facebook does, which is a basket of currencies. But the point is it's not as volatile as Bitcoin because it's not just gonna float up and down 30%, 40%, 50% a day because the dollar isn't gonna change 30 or 40% a day. And that's why they're called stable coins. They're really more grounded into the fluctuations of traditional currency markets. And the third issue, and this is what we're gonna focus on today, is central bank digital currencies. And this is basically central banks getting into the game saying, wait a second, we've got Bitcoin out here, we've got Facebook out here, we can't let all this money supply come into these economies without our traditional money supply having a voice in this. And that's really what's happening around the world. It's been such a sea change in only the past few years. When I was working on this at the IMF, I mean, just a few years ago, there were probably 10, 15 countries in serious exploration. And as we'll talk about, there are now 75 countries in some serious exploration, some with pilots and one country, the, the, the Bahamas has actually launched it. And all it means is that the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank or the Bank of Japan are issuing their own digital currency. They're not letting Facebook do it. They're not letting Bitcoin do it. They're issuing their own. And we'll talk about how they do it what the risk of them doing it, why some banks want to or not. But those are really the kind of the basic categories and the way we think about this issue. Unregulated crypto, stable coins, and central bank digital currencies. So I'll stop because, there. Because this is a, a primer program, uh, you brought a distributed ledger and you also brought a blockchain. Are they the same thing? A distributed yeah, ledger I, blockchain? Daniel, do you, or Adrian, do you want to take this? The, the answer is no, but... Mm -hmm. they, but they're often used interchangeably. Yeah. yeah, I would say one way to think about it is distributed ledger technology is just that it's a it's a technology and blockchain is one example of a distributed ledger technology. It is a single protocol within this sort of umbrella category of distributed ledger. So really there's lots of things that can be a distributed ledger, even if you think about you know, your access database. All that means is that there are multiple nodes and that everybody on the network has a copy of the ledger. There isn't just sort of one copy that exists and is controlled by a centralized location, but often they are used interchangeably. I like to use sort of the analogy of Kleenex and tissue, right? We use those interchangeably, but in fact, Kleenex is a brand of tissue. Um, 
So think of blockchain as one example of a distributed ledger technology. And similarly, the way Josh laid out the different types of digital currencies, right? Bitcoin is one type of cryptocurrency that exists on a blockchain, but there are others. So and because Bitcoin uses blockchain, that's really why it's gained so much notoriety um, and, and because it's become associated with it. So because of Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, distributed ledgers, blockchain, does this mean cash is going away, Daniel? Sure. So uh, no, this doesn't mean that cash is going away. I mean, to, to be clear, a lot of these innovations and developments you know, seek to operate alongside other forms of payment, especially when we're talking about things like central bank digital currency. There are a few who are suggesting that this is intended to immediately displace or even replace cash. Physical cash is but one method of payment. You have commercial bank money, which is what Josh was alluding to, the idea that uh, your counterparty, when you deposit money with a commercial bank, the liability is held by the commercial bank. Um, that's your counterparty. In the case of central bank digital currency, like cash, the counterparty is the central bank. And so it is government issued money backed by the full faith and credit of a government. And that form of currency can operate alongside other forms of currency. Now, it, it is absolutely true that in certain countries, we've seen kind of a development and a trend towards reductions in the use of physical cash. So it is also true that there are central banks thinking about ways to make sure that central bank money can remain in the hands of retail individuals. So to the extent over time, people do prefer to move away from physical cash, there is an, another form that, of, of government money that he or she can access. Um, so complementary to, and may in some places be used as an alternative to physical cash, but it doesn't mean that physical cash has to go away in this ecosystem. So how is the central bank digital currency that you described, Daniel, different from, let's say, the transaction I do on Venmo? Yeah. Am so, I just not transacting a digital dollar? So there, there are a couple of key things. So back to this idea of commercial bank money, because this is very, very important. Commercial bank money is when, you, again, when you take cash and you go deposit it into your commercial bank account, it's being held in an electronic form. But there's no longer an individual kind of bearer instrument that represents your claim on an, on an asset. Instead, it shows up as just a number. The bank maintains a ledger where they're saying, hey, you know, you, Heather, have X amount of money held in your commercial bank account. Now, what certain service providers like Venmo have done is kind of elaborated on this concept of accounts-based systems where Venmo can track these electronic transactions on its own internal ledger system and say that if I, Daniel, want to send money quickly to Adrian, Venmo is able to move that money in their internal ledger. But remember that that money at that point is being held in kind of a commercial bank form, okay? It is no longer a dollar bill backed by the full faith and credit of the government. CBDC is different. Now you've got an instrument where it's actually backed by the full faith and credit of the government. And the rails that you're using, the ledger that you're using to transact, it can look very different than a centralized database um, held by either a, a commercial, in that case of Venmo, a commercial provider. So, so we have to unpack the different units of money, commercial bank money, as compared to central bank backed currency. And then you have to have a conversation about the rails. And Adrian and Josh were explaining that, you know, di uh, distributed ledger technology, you can think of as functionally that the system that you're using to move the currency. Okay. And there are a lot of different options and design choices there that we can get into. But I would separate those two concepts in your mind, the asset or instrument, and then the rails that you're using to transact. So I'm going to move to Adrian to unpack this term, the rails. Right, the rails are important. It's how Visa, MasterCard, American Express operate. It's how you describe this here. Can you explain what the rails are and why we just can't use our Visa card to transact a digital dollar or whether this is different from that? Right, well, I think as, as Daniel was explaining, right, the rails really are the infrastructure. So we, people will be familiar with ACH, right? And when they put money in an account, and in the US, it takes three days typically for that money to show up in account, right? That's money traveling on the ACH rails. 
Similarly, you have wires, right? Where you send a wire and it's available instantly, right? You also have Visa and MasterCard. So there's this plethora of different infrastructures through which we transact. If we had a digital dollar, a CBDC or central bank digital currency, presumably that would have its own set of rails that would allow money, this digital currency to move instantaneously from account to account or person to person, depending on if we're talking about wholesale or, or resale. Um, and what's important, I think, for consumers, right, for individuals to understand is these rails are meant to provide competition. Um, and you see how they've improved over time from, you know, ACH and wires to Visa, MasterCard, right? But they're meant to provide choice and competition in allowing consumers to pay in different ways. So you can, you will see right now Visa, MasterCard, others allowing digital currency to travel on their rails. Um, but a digital dollar would very likely have its own set of rails to travel on um, for lots of reasons, lots of policy reasons that we'll talk about. So Adrian, who's going to develop the central bank uh, digital currencies? Who, who codes this? Who creates this technically? How, how is it accomplished? Yeah, so it's an open question. It's certainly uh, implemented by the central bank, right? It is a fiat or government backed, as we've talked about, uh, digital currency. So it has to be, for it to be a CBDC or a digital dollar, it has to be implemented by the central bank. Um, but that's a different question somewhat into who will develop it, right? Who will build that infrastructure? Who will do the coding of a digital dollar? That may very well be a partnership between the Fed and the private sector. It may just be that the Fed endeavors to do that on its own. We don't really know. In different countries, it's taken different forms. So many countries do have a public-private partnership for the development of their digital currency, um, and, and others do not. Um, but it ultimately will have to be the central bank who issues that currency, who is the counterparty for that currency, as Daniel said, and will have to give us give us as a society the go ahead to have a US backed digital dollar. So I have a question here for Josh that came through our chat. Um, the first one is, can you explain what fiat currency is? And then the second question of the options that you set out in the previous slide, um, which of those are volatile about in their value and why? Sure, so if fiat currency is when a government issues a currency, right? So the, our fiat currency in the US is the dollar and the Federal Reserve issues it. So any country is central bank and backs their currency with the full faith and credit of their government creates a fiat currency. They do it by fiat, by saying this is our currency. So that's essentially what that means. You could say government backed currency as a different way to say it. Of the options we laid out, of course, the most volatile is the ones we see in the news every day. Bitcoin, Dogecoin, unregulated cryptocurrency, because as I said, they're not attached to other currencies, traditional currencies or fiat currencies. But again, stable coins don't have to be attached to currencies. They can also be attached to commodities. Some are attached to gold. And those are more stable because gold prices trade at more stable levels. One thing I would say about the digital dollar, and we can get into it, I would just go back to what Secretary Yellen has said. The reasons why Treasury and the Fed are exploring this are three faster, cheaper, safer. We don't always see that as consumers. You play your Venmo, you think that's fast, you think it's cheap, it, you think it's safe. It could it possibly, with the advent of a digital dollar in the right way, and as many countries are discovering, could actually be done a lot more quickly, cross-border, domestically as well, and safer. And that's the promise of digital currencies. Instantly verifiable, secure transactions, thinking about stimulus checks, unemployment benefits, things that people wait weeks on. Could they be delivered within days, weeks, minutes? Those kind of questions are why we sort of talk about a digital dollar and why it's different. We want to thank freelance writer Leslie Mertz for that question. And for any of you, feel free to add your question to the chat, raise your hand, um, use the feature in, in the um, program here. So I'm going to stick with you, Josh. And what we're going to do is move to the terrific infographic that Atlantic Council offers. And this is also an online resource that anyone can go to. It's interactive on your website. And can you talk to us about this, this graphic? 
and explain the countries that are leading the adoption of digital currencies. Where does the United States fit in with all this? And talk to us about China, because this is a lot of what's driving the news headlines that we see around the digital dollar. So here is um, the static version of your map, but I encourage that there's a link afterwards that you can go to and use this in your reporting as well. So Josh. Thanks, thanks, Heather. And yeah, the digital yuan, China's currency, takes up a lot of um, headline space and a lot of media reporting. And I, I think it's important to unpack that. So happy to talk about it. I put a link to this in the chat as well. So folks can go in and explore because you can click on the countries and really dive into what they're doing in particular. A few high level takeaways from the map. We started doing this a year ago. We were looking at 35 countries. We're now looking at 75 countries. So just to give you a sense of how rapidly this is expanding across the world. Where does the US stand? We're very far behind in the US. If you think of the big four central banks, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and the Federal Reserve, we're four out of four in that category. The ECB has said they think they'll have a digital euro by the middle of the decade. The Bank of England has now announced a new project with Treasury in the UK. The Bank of Japan wants to do a pilot project, and we are still studying the issue. We hope to hear more from the Fed this fall, and we can talk about that. Now, the rest of the world, and we convene central bankers at the Atlantic Council, are asking for US leadership. They want to know what the US is going to do, because they are in a process of developing their own digital currencies. Some of them are exploring options with China, and they need to understand how these things are going to be interoperable down the road. And they don't want to build technology systems that the Fed is going to say in a few years from now, oh, we're not comfortable that you built something like that because our digital dollar won't work with that. So a few countries that are ahead of the game. Sweden, their e-corona project, they have a pilot going on right now. They're testing it. You can, uh, if you click on the tracker, there's more you can learn about it. One thing they're struggling with that China's figured out is what we call near field communication, how you do the transfer of money offline. And that's a real value of digital currencies because we know we can do Venmo if we have an internet connection, but what about when you don't have an internet connection? What about rural areas? Can you transfer money that way just like cash? So Sweden's working on that right now. Saudi Arabia, they're doing a project with the UAE called Project Aber. This is a cross-border payment test. Can they use distributed ledger technology to share currency between the two countries? So these are a couple countries that are moving fast. And then of course, China, the major economy that's actually developed a digital yuan. It is in circulation right now. We believe somewhere between likely 500,000 people are using it. Uh, there are about 28 pilot cities tested soon. And we think a rollout will expand ahead of the Beijing Winter Olympics. And just a couple things to debunk and demystify about the digital yuan. Very small amount, right? 0.01 of the money supply right now is digital yuan. So it's used in very select places. It is not any threat to the dollar in the near term. Uh, and it's often ca categorized that way is that China or China is trying to take over the dollar. You have to understand China's domestic priorities. You know, they are dealing with Tencent and Alipay, the financial services providers within their country. The People's Bank of China is thinking of competition with them. Do they want those companies to control all the payments or do they want to have more say in the payments? They're thinking about macroeconomic policy like other countries are. Can they deliver stimulus checks and other ways through their digital currency? So this is, this is how China thinks about it. Not so much from the international perspective that we think about it of overtaking the dollar, although that may be a benefit from them down the road, but they think about what is the domestic use for this? First and foremost for China, surveillance, data. Can they understand how people are spending their money in near real time? What are the social implications of that? And that's a big issue with digital currencies, privacy. And that's the big holdup in the West when it comes to digital currencies. How do you balance privacy and anonymity? So I'll leave it there. So Adrian, we have a question here from Jessica Stone. It's great to see you on here, Jessica. She is asking what transaction houses stand to benefit or lose from moving to a digital dollar? But then I think this is a very important point. What does this mean for people who use cash worldwide, especially when we talk about some of the privacy concerns that Josh just brought up as far as tracking goes? Yeah, those are great questions, Jessica. And let me sort of take them in reverse order. Uh, I think as Daniel mentioned, at least in the US context, it's, I don't think we're going to see a replacement of physical cash. Um, and part of the reason is for financial inclusion, 
reasons, right? We, uh, Josh mentioned, right, that for a lot of countries, they haven't figured out how they can use a digital currency without, an, without internet access. As we know, there are lots of people in the US that don't have ready access to broadband and, and internet and cell service, um, but there's also lots of privacy concerns. So I think cash in the US is gonna be around for a long time and will, if we develop a digital dollar, will exist alongside it. And you, know, you can see evidence of um, us wanting to preserve cash when you think about New York City or Philadelphia. And the same is even true for the UK where they've made the determination that businesses have to accept cash for financial inclusion reasons. So for the US, I don't think physical currency is going anywhere anytime soon. It's very different from a Sweden or even a China, right? Where they're more aggressively moving to cashless societies. With respect to the first question, the, the implementation of a digital dollar will be important for clearing houses and for settlement because as Josh alluded to early on, right, we expect a digital dollar subject to certain design choices that the Fed might make to be faster, uh, cheaper, and more secure. So right now where we've got you know, some uh, settlement processes that might take two days and they, that two day window right, uh, increases the risk that the counterparties won't be able to satisfy those transactions. If you can reduce that time down to one day, half a day, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses to doing something instantaneously, you reduce that counterparty risk in a system such that you, you don't have uh, the risk that somebody defaults effectively on a transaction. So having a digital currency can really help make the capital markets much more efficient and safer. So a quick follow-up question to that, Adrian. Will I still need to exchange currency if I hold a digital dollar? Land at the airport, do I still need to go stand in line at the, um, the booth to get my local currency? Yeah, so you'll, you know, again, unclear. Um, it'll depend on how it develops, but it's unlikely you'll have to stand at a booth to do it for sure. I think the most likely scenario is that you'll make some exchange, but it'll be in your digital wallet, right? It'll be in the app on your phone, where you'll be able to switch from you know, a dollar to a yuan, a dollar to a krona, a dollar to a pesa, depending on where peso, depending on where you're you're traveling, or at the point of sale, whether it's online or in person, you'll just be able to select the currency in which you want to make the transaction. That's the way the Cambodian pilot has been working, is that it allows consumers to select uh, between local currency and the dollar at the point of sale. Um, so you'll still probably be doing some exchanges, but it won't be this analog version of waiting in line at a booth, right, and waiting for the teller to give you physical cash, unless, again, you decide you want that. Much more likely is you'll step off the plane, you'll open your digital wallet, and you'll be able to convert your currency. Daniel, what do you see as the geopolitical implications from where you sit working on the project that you're involved with? Yeah, so so look, it, it, it's something where leadership here by the United States, and in our case, when we're talking about the digital dollar project, we're very focused on the role of the US dollar. And we do think leadership is important in terms of setting standards and norms around central bank digital currencies. Interoperability is going to be very important. That was exactly what Adrian was just mentioning, is the idea, can you convert easily from one CBDC to another or from a CBDC into other types of digital assets? Then there's considerations around things like privacy, as Josh was saying. What are the norms and expectations that global citizens have when it comes to the data collection aspects of CBDC? That's very important. Now, when it comes to the actual role of the US dollar, you know, I, I would suggest there are many factors that drive the reserve currency status of the US dollar. And technology and friction in transactions is but one. And I don't think it's even one of the, the, the major ones as of today because the markets for dollars are quite efficient and effective and we can still move them quite well. Is it the way you would design a system today? No, uh, that legacy time, that, that lag of two days for clearing and settlement and the potential counterparty risks involved in, in, in the way we move currencies and transact today can be improved upon. But what it does mean is that as you look forward, you know, could that technology and friction become something that's either a competitive advantage for a currency or a disadvantage over time? 
If it becomes easier and easier for folks to transact with um, uh, new forms of CBDC, that could gradually erode or amplify the status of various currencies. In my opinion, the US dollar actually stands more to gain um, when we think about this proactively, I think that there are so many appealing aspects of the U.S. dollar that if you add in this, this decrease in friction and in costs um, associated in transacting in dollars, the bigger challenge may actually be increased uh, uh, international dollarization than the other way around. So I think it's complicated. I, I, I think this is not like an overnight, the sky is falling, and it's not the reason that central banks should be pursuing these efforts is, is a, a, from a, a defensive posture. Um, but a proactive, forward-leaning stance, understanding that the future of money is at stake here, norms, values, interoperability, all of these are really important functions and features, and it's better to imbue that early in the, in the CBDC development process than later. So it's the friction, it's the delay, it's the, the issues of transacting money as they currently exist today in the legacy systems. Is that why we can't stay with the way things are today? Well, it, it, you know, he, here's another way. The answer is you always can improve. And if you were to develop s systems, you know, from scratch today, you wouldn't use legacy technology and processes from 20 years ago. So, so the idea that you just, you know, settle on the status quo and assume this is as good as it will ever be is probably not a very good way to win the future. Um, so, so, you know, systems today do work. And in certain countries like the United States, payment systems are very effective. And this is why you've heard all of us say, this is not to replace, it would operate alongside. There may be certain use cases or functions where a CBDC proves to be more effective. Um, that will be a choice. That will be an option for individuals. Just like you have a choice today, whether you wanna use credit, debit, cash, these are all options. And that optionality is a very positive thing. Um, the one thing I would hone in on for a second though, we haven't had a chance to, to kind of delve into an important design feature here. So Josh set out at the outset what a central bank digital currency is. And at its most basic form, it's when the currency is issued by the central bank and is, it is actual central bank money. So we've belabored that point. But there are really important design choices in terms of the form that that money takes. And I want to highlight one, tokenization versus accounts-based systems. So what do I mean by that? An accounts-based system would be effectively the central bank is making central bank issued money available to a broader set of the population at either the wholesale uh, uh, level or at a retail level. Tokenization is a little bit different. This is the idea that you are creating a digital dollar that is an analog to cash, to an actual dollar bill, but in a digital environment. A token is a digital bearer instrument. If I hold it, it means that I own it. If I can prove that I'm the owner of this digital dollar token, it's mine. Whereas in an accounts-based system, the way you prove ownership over something is by showing that you own the account, but that money within it is the, are those numbers you see on a screen. It's not cash, it's not tangible. So think of a digital dollar in tokenized format as, as a true analog to physical cash in a digital world. Why am I mentioning that? Because I personally, and, and from a digital dollar project perspective, we think that there could be some real advantages to tokenizing a central bank digital currency. Other potential opportunities, we talk about financial inclusion and access. If we can replicate some of the features of cash, but in a digital context, you may be able to bring in additional un- and underbanked individuals into the financial system who can hold these bearer instruments and have more ready access to traditional services. So these are things that we are thinking about. We can go into more details about these design choices, but token versus accounts-based, very important. The rails, is it a centralized database held, owned by the central bank, or is it somewhere in the middle of you know, an open public blockchain like Bitcoin and that database, is there some kind of a private permission you know, a ledger that's maintained by a set of actors. That's an important design choice. Do retail individuals hold bank accounts at the central bank or are they receiving digital dollars through the two-tiered banking system as we do today? These are some of the like really fundamental thorny questions that need to be addressed before we can unlock what the potential and the promise is because there's so much between here and there. 
what I'm going to do is go to Josh and have him pick up on this concept of token again, because as you said, Daniel, it is so important to understanding this. So I don't think um, we can talk about it too much at this point in the primer. Um, for some people who are brand new to this space, when you say token, the first thing that might come to mind was it was cool to get those at Chuck E. Cheese to play the <laughs> video game. The second token that'll come up is I hold a little RSA token, right? To get my code to get into an account. But we're not talking about either of those tokens here. Josh, can you explain a bit more again about this token concept for folks here? Yeah, and I think I think what Daniel said is spot on. I agree with everything. And it's important when you think of the world that most countries that are developing central bank digital currencies are doing it in token form. So that's telling you that's a demand signal that that's kind of what people want. That's what banks want. And, you know, I, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this, but cash is the sort of natural analog, as Daniel said, uh, instead of logging into your Bank of America, and it says I have X amount of money, you have the actual money on your phone. And so you might have 50 digital dollars on your phone. You might have 100 digital dollars. You actually have the dollars. And in China right now, they look like pictures of the yuan. And you just share them. You hold your phone up with a bank with, you know, you're at a kiosk. You're, they have a receptacle. You hold your phone up. They take them. Those are tokens, right? Those aren't accounts. And so I think that's the best way to think about it. Think about how you use cash in your daily life. Think about how you use online banking in your daily life and draw that distinction of how a digital dollar would be different. So you, you have Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Stellar. Why can't one of those become the digital dollar? Why do we need to create this uh, other form using its own rails? Well, it, I think there's an important political debate to be had here. First of all, of course, those currencies aren't attached to dollars, right? They're based on scarcity, on mining, other factors that give Bitcoin value and others. The whole premise of Bitcoin is to move away from a central system of financial control. And so there's a sort of ideological debate going on here where people who are proponents of Bitcoin look at central bank digital currencies as a threat because they say, well, hold on a second. We don't want the central bank getting involved in this space using the technology we developed to now re-control the money supply. They think they're breaking down walls, creating a new monetary and financial system around the world. So the idea that you would sort of uh, co-opt Bitcoin into becoming a digital dollar, I think would start uh, quite a few Twitter fights to say the least. But, but there is a in between here and that's stable coins, right? Because stable coins are already attached to dollars or attached to euros or attached to yen. So the idea that somehow a federal reserve could license or contract with stable coins to deliver digital dollars in some way, that to me is not so far fetched an idea and you know, is, is something that we can talk about and explore. So that's again, the difference between the crypto, the unregulated decentralized crypto and the stable coin. And I think that's an important distinction. Adrian, Leslie has a question here again, and she writes to us, so CBDC and government run digital dollars offer value um, offers value stability, but have potential privacy concerns. On the other hand, things like Bitcoin offer privacy, but are wildly unstable. Are those two the major differences from a consumer point of view? They are some of the major differences, certainly. Although let's double click on the, the privacy piece. When, when Daniel and Josh were talking about token-based versus account-based, and Daniel said, tokens are very similar. They're basically cash in digital form. They're also potentially anonymous. And these go back to these design questions, right? How would a Fed, how would any central bank design their digital currency? As Josh mentioned, China has designed their digital currency with sort of surveillance and tracking in mind. You can imagine in the US context, right? We would design a digital dollar with privacy in mind. And especially if it's token based, it functions very much like cash in that it's untraceable, right? That the Fed or any government actor would not be able to see where you're buying things, what you're buying, right? Now, a, a private company that is overseeing the rails might be able to see some levels of data, but not others. Um, so there's lots of ways you can design a central bank digital currency to maintain privacy or not, depending on your jurisdiction and what the values of the government are. So it's not as, as black and white as a central bank digital currency does not offer privacy. It can certainly be designed to offer all the levels of privacy 
that we are accustomed to today. Um, I think the other big difference as Josh alluded to is sort of centralized versus decentralized. And these are ideological questions. There's also a bandwidth issue. I think one of the things that people don't appreciate about the Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies is that as popular as they've be become and as much as they are sold on the promise of speed, there, there's actually quite a, a limit on the number of transactions that can take place in a single second or in a fraction of a second. And that has to do with the way blockchain technology works. But ideally in a system, right, like the US where you have millions and trillions of transactions taking place all the time, you want a system that is sufficiently robust to handle that volume in real time and cryptocurrencies just can't do that. And, and, and I would just say, this is oh, the yeah. issue the Fed is testing right now with MIT, and they're going to tell us about in the fall. How much data can we process using maybe not DLT, but something similar to distributed ledger technology? So it's a very real question in the US right now. Daniel, can you talk to us a little bit about the MIT project? But then also referring to this slide, I'm going to make this very simple. What are the ingredients, right, that make a digital dollar? What are you looking for? Yeah. And I think this slide that you put together um, helps explain that. Let me let me make one overarching comment. Not you know I, I don't want to speak to the other panelists, but I I would just about this interplay with crypto and Bitcoin and how and why does that matter? I do think it's fair to give a nod to Bitcoin and to say that but for the development of Bitcoin, we're not having this conversation right now. I do think it captured imagination and mind share for people to think about, are there better ways today? And to boil what this is all about in my mind is that computers connect, the internet can connect systems. We know we can move information very quickly with low cost, very efficient with, with, with relatively few intermediaries. And the question became, is there a way for us to do that with the information about value and about ownership over value in a more automated way? And that's what Bitcoin really stands for, I believe, at its core. And it's getting us to think about that in the way we transact all financial assets and instruments, including money itself. So, so, so I give that, that, that nod. Um, MIT, you know, look, I think we're, we're, we're eager to hear more about what MIT and the Boston Fed are working on. They're looking at some of the technical aspects, as, as Josh and uh, just alluded to. Um, it's reported that they'll be releasing more information about some of their findings, either late summer or into the fall. Uh, so that's really important work that those teams are doing, and those are excellent teams that are doing it. Um, to your question here, you know, about this slide, again, I, I, I've covered some of it, so I may be brief and with some of my comments, but to be clear, you know, the Digital Dollar Project is a nonprofit exploring uh, US CBDC, came up with a proposed champion model. So as we look at design choices, those ingredients that you're talking about, Heather, we suggested what we think would be the best test case of a champion model to see if that brings the greatest benefits. And a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, because it's so complicated to understand how it will ripple through a domestic and global economy, we think needs to be done through pilots and trials and testing so we can measure these benefits. But what this slide represents is a couple of things. You know, tokenization versus accounts based, we've covered that. We think from a digital dollar project perspective that tokens can kind of bring back and unlock some of the value of physical bearer instruments, but in a digital format, which is really interesting. Like that idea that I can have possession of a unique dollar and be able to transact that unique dollar with somebody else. Um, the two tier distribution is really important. We haven't really focused much on that yet. And, and I mentioned it very quickly, but there are some that, that are suggesting the idea of a central bank digital currency being made available by a central bank directly to the retail individual. So you'd be able to effectively open an account or a wallet service with the central bank. What we're proposing is maintaining the two-tiered banking system. So distribution would occur through banks or a regulated you know, fintech company, um, much the way that you withdraw money for physical cash from an ATM today. The ATM is actually owned by your bank and you're withdrawing physical cash. And so that's how distribution could occur. We think that's important because if you were to go direct to the central bank, that's incredibly disruptive to the way the banking system works today. So you don't want to undermine some of the, the stability and benefits of the, of the banking sector. We've talked about privacy, a lot of design choices there. You know, If you hold the analogy with physical cash, you would err on the side of anonymity. Um, that obviously is a little bit difficult though, because while it might be hard to move a million dollars of physical cash from point A to point B, 
you can do that with digital dollars. So, you know, in a testing phase, maybe you limit the amount that an individual can hold, um, and maybe that allows you to err more on the side of anonymity versus the amount of information that's disclosed. There's also privacy settings in terms of the rails, who's maintaining the network, and how much access to information those, those nodes actually have. And I'll finally, you know, really blow everyone's mind with like introducing some, some of the technologies that could help solve for the privacy challenges. There are things like zero knowledge proofs, which I'm sure there are some that are far smarter than, and can explain it, but the gist of it is you're able to verify certain underlying information without disclosing a complete set of information. So if you're trying to perform anti-money laundering, know your customer checks, you may be able to verify that somebody is not on a terrorist watch list without having to reveal to the network the name and social security number and identity of that individual. So open question as to whether technology can help solve for some of these challenges. Um, let me think if there's anything else I want to flag. We talked a little bit again about rails, whether you're, uh, you know, I think about it on a spectrum. Are you talking about a central database that's maintained or are you talking about open public blockchains or something in the middle, permissioned blockchains? That's my guess as to where things will, will settle in some jurisdictions. Um, but obviously a central bank will have to have substantial and sufficient control over the network. The last thing I just want to mention in terms of design choices is that one of the reasons that people are excited about this concept of CBDC is the, this notion of programmability. If you create a, 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 the dollar in a format that you can easily code business logic or regulatory logic around the money itself, you can automate economic transactions. So what do I mean by that? I mean, like if I'm trying to a very simple version would be my refrigerator, which is now a smart refrigerator, can measure when my milk jug is getting low. And there's logic, there's software that can automatically process payment. Um, and maybe a drone comes and delivers a new you know, gallon of milk to me. But it's that automation feature around economic activity that gets people excited. The more you reduce intermediaries and the need for messaging between intermediaries, which is how account space systems work today, the, the, the easier it will be to envision a world where you're automating more and more functions. Those could be regulatory functions. Those could be these business logic functions. So, so that's a piece of all of this that uh, may take us a little far afield, but I figure I should at least introduce. So there, there are a few things that you brought up, Daniel, that we're going to turn to Adrian to answer as primer questions. Um, the first being, what's a public permission network and what's a node? Yeah, good question. So... Think of a, a node as just an access point to, to the network. Um, so the same way we all access the internet, right, through our laptops or through our computers, right, that is a node, it's an entry point into um, the network. When we talk about distributed ledger, we talk about permissioned and permissionless. Permissioned meaning you have to be granted access. So Daniel, Josh, and I could have a permissioned network. And if Heather, you want to join, right, there might be certain criteria or identity requirements that you have to meet to join part of our network versus permissionless, right? It's really public source. Anybody with the right computing power, right, can plug into the network and have a copy of the ledger, much like blockchain works. And those, right? and those requirements are often referred to as governance. Well, they could of be, the network. right? So, um, so there are groups of banks or a consortia of banks that have their own private distributed ledger technology. So it could be, you know, if we're a bunch of private sector actors, we say, well, you have to be a bank with, you know, certain compliance regulations met of a certain asset size, right? And we decide you're our partner. And so you've been permissioned into the network. Right, it could be governments, and you know, and some governments might be excluded. So it really can be sort of any set of criteria from the individual level to the institutional level to the government level. So, Adrian, what do you think the impact of this is going to be on the unbanked? Will it create a greater digital divide? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, as Josh mentioned earlier, if we don't get to a point where we're thinking about through the the near field communication, people without internet access or without cell access will continue to be left out of the system. So that is an important design feature. Um, and it's part of the reason, you know, Daniel mentioned the account-based systems where individuals would have essentially bank accounts at the Fed. 
part of the reason people argue for that is they say, well, look, to the extent you have a certain population that doesn't trust banks, that can't afford bank fees, that doesn't have access to a bank, right? A Fed account, as they're called, could essentially function as a public option. Now, it doesn't get rid of all the issues, right? You may still have trust issues if you feel like maybe you don't want the government to see your account. Um, but that's one argument for Fed accounts. But you could still maintain, as Daniel said, and I agree, the two-tiered banking system, have digital currency be programmed in a way that and regulate bank accounts so that they become free, develop the, the near field technologies um, so that you don't they don't require internet access for transactions to be made. You know, think about digital identity and zero knowledge proof and other ways to make it easier for the un and under bank to access the financial system. So certainly the potential is there to include those who are traditionally excluded, lower their costs and lower their soft costs in ways that, you know, we've just started talking about today. So if you think about those who are paycheck to paycheck, the fact that ACH takes three days from the time their employer, even with a direct deposit, right, gives them money and the time that money is available to them, that three days is when people make the decision to not use direct deposit and instead go to a check casher or instead go to a payday lender. If you can reduce that time to zero so that people are being paid instantaneously and maybe even daily, which studies have shown is much better for financial health, right? You've now decreased the cost and the, and the use of predatory products dramatically. So there are tons of wonderful implications for a digital dollar uh, and low and moderate income and excluded populations. Some of them subject to the design choices we make, but there's a, a lot of potential there. Adrian, you brought up digital identity. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I want to turn to Josh and talk about how is digital identity assigned to the digital dollar? especially in relation to anti-money laundering laws. Yeah, and, and this is really the, I think, the fundamental question, and to the extent Congress has been involved in this so far, it's been involved from this angle. Um, and so, you know, I, when you think about what Congress has to do in order to step up a digital dollar, we've had it backwards in the United States so far. So basically, the Fed told the Federal Reserve of Boston to work with MIT to design a digital dollar, but then we never got the high level buy-in from the administration or Congress to say, why do you want a digital dollar? And until you have that sort of guidance and privacy is a big part of that, how will you regulate? How will you have oversight? It was really unfair to ask the Boston Fed along with MIT to design something. You know, it's like design it. Well, why do you want it? Well, we're not sure. That's a hard question to be asked. And so when you come to the privacy question, you can look at what other countries in the world are doing. And there are all different regimes in place right now and the pilot projects going on. Most of them retain some level of anonymity. The question is, do the consumers and the users believe that? And so far, you know, from the data we have and the anecdotal evidence is that they don't, and they're willing to trade some of what they perceive loss of anonymity for the convenience of use. And China is a good example of this, where there's been general good adoption of the digital yuan so far. The PBOC has guaranteed people that they cannot monitor the transactions. Consumers that are interviewed, to the extent you can rely on these interviews, have said, we don't believe that, but they're still willing to do it. The question is, with the United States, how would we adopt it? And there are all different questions, and Daniel alluded to this as well, is how could we do it? There are talks about unmasking systems, right? So from AML, KYC issues, could Treasury flag a transaction, just like we do with cash now? Hey, $10,000 got sent over here. That's above our threshold of a de minimis transaction. That seems suspicious to us. We need to go to a version of basically like a FISA court and see how that transaction was spent. So there are regulatory questions that have to be addressed here. They can be dealt with, but until the US deals with it, the rest of the world is still waiting a little bit. And as much as these are issues for us, they're very much issues for the Europeans, which are as sensitive, if not more sensitive to the privacy concerns than we are. So if we can figure out the answer here, along with Congress, then the rest of the world, I think, will adopt a US anonymity privacy system. And that's the challenge. How concerned should the average consumer be in a world right now where our purchases and our online behavior attract purchases are correlated, how concerned should we be that this is just another avenue to correlate everything around us and to track the boots that we just bought for the next six months in our social media pages? 
Well, it's, you know, it's a consumer habit question and it's going to be different in each country. So in the US, do we feel more comfortable Amazon knowing this than the federal government? And the answer may be that some people feel a lot more comfortable with Amazon knowing how they're spending every penny than the federal government. But none of this is to say that a digital dollar would replace it. So you would choose when you wanted to use your digital dollars. Maybe when you interact with the government and pay your taxes or have unemployment benefits is when you get digital dollars, right? So you have control over the system. And I think that's an important way to think about it. But think about how China's using this because Daniel brought up programmable money. I think that is so key. We talk about the benefits of programmable money. There are a lot of risk of programmable money. What if you say that my money expires in two months? That could be really useful from like a macroeconomic policy perspective. Oh man, I can get people to spend money instead of save money. Wow. But there are a lot of sort of civil liberty concerns involved in that. What if China says we have our digital yuan, but because Nike boycotted what's happening in Xinjiang, no one can use digital yuan at a Nike store. We just flip that switch. So think about the implications of programmable money, a lot of benefits, but a lot of risk in the wrong hands. And this is the balancing act with CBDCs. It, and Josh, can I, can I come back for one second to this privacy point? And, and I wanna just emphasize one thing. The status quo is favoring scale and it's favoring models that are already you know, raising very serious privacy implications. So what do I mean by that? It is very efficient for a government actor or a private sector actor to create a massive database and use that to monitor transactions and to, and to facilitate transactions. It can be fast, it can be very low cost, it's super efficient at scale. The, the trouble with that is, is that people may have some concern about you know, all of that information being housed within a private siloed database, whether it's government maintained or private sector maintained. And that's the direction that we're already going. If you look at WeChat, Alipay, I mean, these are platforms that already have well over a billion users. So I think what we're actually saying is that that discussion from a policy and regulatory perspective needs to be had in general. And the CBDC conversation is actually just thrusting that conversation into the, into the light. Um, what it allows you to do is start thinking a little bit more about system design. Are there privacy, resiliency, and redundancy benefits to not having, you know, these single honeypots of information. That's where, again, when we talk about the rails and the rights and access and privileges um, and, and, and access to information, that design becomes so important. But I just want to underscore that absent any action on CBDC, that privacy concern that you are raising is paramount already. Right. I'm going to turn it over to Adrienne because I know she wanted to weigh in here. And then I'm going to ask the last question to her. What happens if I drop my phone, which has my digital wallet on it, in the toilet? Right. Well, I think, you know, just as uh, Daniel was alluding to this, these already being questions we're dealing with and CBDC sort of thrusting them to the fore. Um, this will be a system design question, right? So the same way, you know, if you lose your, or forget your bank password now when you want to log in, there is a protocol that you follow to create a new password, replace it, have them send it to you, right? Presumably we would have a very similar system if you drop your, your phone in the toilet, forget your password that allows you to access your digital wallet with all your digital dollars on it, right? That you would leverage some form of identity biometrics, legal, physical identity, behavioral identity, right? There's, there's lots of ways we could do it. So in order to have access to your account reinstated, you obviously want it to be a very robust form of uh, authentication, right? More robust than passwords and pins and even security questions. So you can imagine, right, in the ideal state, it would be some combination of legal identification, biometric identification, right? To really make sure the security there is robust, but there would have to be a design uh, feature that allows for renewed access to your digital wallet. I wanna thank um, all the panelists today. I wanna let Michelle and Leslie know, I'm sorry we couldn't get to your questions, but if you visit nationalpress.org, you can get the contact information for our panelists today. I'm taking the liberty to say that they're more than happy to respond to you directly to those questions that you have. Um, I wanna thank the National Press Foundation for making this possible and the Heinrich Foundation for providing the funding for this programming on trade. National Press Foundation offers training to journalists worldwide at no cost. 
and we appreciate all the contributions that make that possible. If you find today's program valuable or the other offerings that nationalpress.org and their entire team make possible, please visit their website and visit the donation page and make a contribution to help support this type of programming forward. Once again, my name is Heather Dahl. On behalf of Josh, Adrian, Daniel, and Sunny, and the entire NPF team, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>